Good morning, Fodgham. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you about warping space and time. As you can see from the little subtitle there, I'm going to be talking about the science fact and a little bit about the science fiction of black holes. So I'm going to be covering a brief history, very brief, just a, a few sentences, and then I'll be looking at most of the talk is on the science fact of how black holes come to be, and then a little bit of science fiction, and then I'll just wrap up with a, with a comment right at the end. So a brief history. So let's just make sure we understand what we're talking about first. So a black hole is a region of space from which nothing, not even light, can escape. And you might think that the concept of a black hole is a fairly recent thing. In the last few decades, we've started thinking about what they are and whether or not we can do anything about observing the region around black holes. But the concept of a black hole probably started before you realize. In other words, it dates back to the 18th century. Reverend John Mitchell came up with this quote. I'll just paraphrase it slightly. If you take a sphere of the same density of the sun and make it larger by a factor of 500 compared to our sun, then all light emitted from that body would be made to return toward it by its gravity. In other words, it was realized as early as the 18th century that if a body is massive enough, its gravity could stop light escaping. So although that's not how we think of stars working, we think of stars as being hot and bright and luminous, but it was realized that, well, maybe, if they were massive enough, light would not be able to escape. But although this was stated back in the late 1700s, that was all but forgotten. And these so-called dark stars were ignored for basically all of the 19th century. And it wasn't until the 20th century that the idea was picked up again. I'm not going to talk through all the details. So this is sort of the key players in the early part of the uh, 20th century who started thinking about what might happen when very massive stars perhaps get compressed to very small volumes. There's a few people you will recognize and probably a few people you won't. So there's Einstein in 1915 and uh, a few years later Eddington realized that well odd things are going to happen. If you take a large mass and compress it into a small volume odd things are going to happen when you reach a particular size and this size became known ultimately by the name of this individual, Schwarzschild. So when you take a mass and compress it to a particular size called the Schwarzschild radius, odd things can happen, including you make a black hole. But also, people ran the calculations produced by Einstein and thought, well, not only can light not escape, but also it looks like time comes to a standstill at the surface of this rather odd body, take a large mass, compress it to a small volume. So if time comes to a standstill, the objects that are produced by taking a mass and compressing it, these objects were not simply called dark stars, they were sometimes called frozen stars because time comes to a standstill. So a lot of players had a lot of things to say about what happens when stars come to the end of their lives and get compressed to small volumes. But in order to get a reasonable understanding of black holes, we need a few pieces of the puzzle to put together first. And those pieces of the puzzle are, firstly, we have to understand why light can't escape. In other words, we have to understand the concept of an escape velocity from a body, whether it be the sun or the earth or the moon. We have to think about not the details, not the maths of general relativity, but we have to think about what Einstein said about how mass affects space and time. And it's worth having a think about how black holes can be formed, in other words, how they are part of stellar evolution. So the evolution of stars and galaxies can naturally lead to the process that results in a black hole. And finally, we need to think about how it is that we can detect whether or not a black hole exists. If no light is coming out of this black hole, how can we possibly see it? How can we possibly detect these objects in space? So we need to think about each of these pieces of the jigsaw to get a round understanding of black holes. It doesn't really matter in which order we look at these four pieces, but I'm going to deal with them in the order I've just presented them. So firstly, we're going to look at escape velocity. 
And just to make it easier for me and perhaps you, and if anybody wants to take a copy of the uh, slides, the handout of the slides themselves, I'm using this particular colored notation of the pieces of the jigsaw in the top left-hand corner to remind ourselves which particular concept we're thinking of. So the blue is escape velocity. So the escape velocity for any object is simply the velocity with which we have to throw something for it to leave the gravitational pull of that body. So if I wanted this particular laser pointer to leave the gravitational pull of the Earth, I have to throw it at a particular speed. Let's assume that I haven't attached a rocket motor that's continually pushing it. I just want to throw it fast enough so that it will leave the Earth's pull. It doesn't actually matter which way I throw it. I could throw it vertically up. I could throw it sideways. If we ignore the atmosphere, as all physicists do, let's just assume air resistance doesn't make any difference, we simply have to throw this at a particular speed which is dictated by how big the Earth is, the mass of the Earth, and how far we are from the center of the Earth. And, of course, that's roughly the same for any object on the surface of the Earth. And we find that when we work out the mechanics, when, when we apply good old Newtonian mechanics to the problem, we find how fast do we have to throw something for it to leave. It only depends on the ratio of the mass to the radius. For any object, let's just assume they're all spherical objects, for any object, if we want to work out how fast do we have to throw something for it to leave, it only depends on the ratio of the mass to the radius. And we can calculate some escape velocities. For instance, if we want to leave the surface of the moon, how fast do we have to throw a rock for it to leave the surface of the moon and not come back? We'd have to throw it at about 2 kilometers per second, or about 5,000 miles an hour in old money, for those who prefer miles an hour. So, the Apollo astronauts returning from the moon didn't have to accelerate much because the pull of the moon is not that large because the moon is a relatively small object. If we want to escape from the Earth, if I wanted to launch this laser pointer into space and it not return to Earth, I would have to throw it at 11 kilometers per second or about 25,000 miles an hour. Roughly speaking, that's how fast the Apollo astronauts were going when they left Earth in order to make it to the Moon. And if we do the calculation for the surface of the Sun, don't try this at home, but if you were on the surface of the Sun, you would have to throw an object at 600 kilometers per second in order to leave. In other words, about, well, more than a million miles an hour. And that might sound ludicrously fast, but remember that even this figure here of 600 kilometers per second is only a tiny fraction of the speed of light. It's only about 0.2% of the speed of light, which is just as well because if it was any different, then the sun would have difficulty in getting that light to us. And of course, the light does arrive at Earth from the sun, so it must be that the escape velocity is below the speed of light. Perhaps it's surprising that it's only 0.2%. So we can do a thought experiment and we can say, well, if the speed at which you need to throw something to have it escape from the gravitational pull of an object depends on the ratio of the mass to the radius, let's do a thought experiment and say, let's take the sun and compress it. Let's keep the mass the same, let's not change the mass, but let's just put it into a smaller and smaller and smaller volume by compressing the sun. So the actual size of the sun is given by that little yellow dot, and its escape velocity, given on the vertical axis, is 600 kilometers per second. But theoretically, or hypothetically, if I were to take the sun and compress it until it was in a smaller volume, the escape velocity would go up. Remember, the escape velocity depends on the mass, which isn't changing in this problem, divided by the radius. So if I make the radius smaller, the escape velocity is going to go up. If I were to make the sun even smaller, the escape velocity would go up even higher. And if I keep compressing, now that the object is smaller than the British Isles, the escape velocity would now be 30,000 kilometers per second. If I compress the sun until it's only the size of the northwest of England, or less than that, a big city, it would go up again. And if I compressed the sun until it was in a volume of only about three kilometers, then the escape velocity would end up being the velocity of light. The escape velocity would be 300,000 kilometers per second. So if I take the mass of the sun and compress it to a sphere of size about three kilometers, I end up with something with an escape velocity 
larger than the speed of light, so nothing can escape, including light itself. And we reach a point where we talk about event horizon. Event horizon is just a sort of an imaginary sphere surrounding the sun. Light can fall in, objects can fall in, but nothing can come out. It's a sort of one-way membrane, if you like. And it occurs at a particular radius, which we've come to label the Schwarzschild radius, just because that was the person who first came up with this idea of a one-way membrane. Things can fall in, but nothing can come out at that point. So with the sun, we compress it to three kilometers, we can make a black hole. I don't know quite how to do that, but if it were to happen, the sun would become a black hole. And we can ask, well, what would happen if we started with a body other than the sun? Rather than take the sun and say, if we compressed it to three kilometers, we can generate a black hole. What if we start with a different object? For instance, what if we start with the Earth? We take the mass and we can calculate what would the radius have to be, by how much would we have to compress it in order to generate an escape velocity greater than the speed of light. Well, it turns out for a body, the mass of the Earth, we would have to compress it to centimeters or so, about the size of a marble. If we could take the Earth and compress it to the size of a marble, the Earth would become a black hole. If we were to start with an object the size of the moon, the mass of the moon, and compress it, we would have to compress it down to smaller than a grain of sand in order to get the conditions for which it would turn into a black hole. And if we were to take a mass equivalent to, let's say, well, I don't know, the mass of Mount Everest, we would have to compress that until it was smaller than an atom before we would get an object whose escape velocity was greater than the speed of light. Of course, we have no idea how to do this. This is hypothetical in the sense of if we started with this mass, if we could compress it enough, we can generate a black hole. But just because we don't know how to do it, it doesn't mean it can't be done. The laws of physics say if you were to do that, you would generate a black hole. So that's the idea of escape velocity. Now let's think about what Einstein had to say about the universe. I'm not going to go through the Einstein's general theory of relativity, but you could, if you wish, condense his general theory of relativity down to one simple equation. And of course, it's simple only by deception because there's an awful lot of complexity inside the G and inside the T. But what it's effectively saying is you can relate the curvature of space, the way space behaves, compared to the, and uh, equate it to, how much mass and how much energy there is in a particular space, in a particular region. So the maths is horrible, but you could reduce it to something that says, well, space isn't simply totally impassive. Space reacts to the existence of mass. Mass tells space how to change or how to curve. We'll deal with curve in just a moment. And in a sense, space tells mass how to move. In other words, mass affects space and space affects mass. They are not, unlike Newtonian mechanics, they are not two entirely separate things. With Isaac Newton, we assume that masses move around the universe like pieces on a chessboard, and the chessboard never changes depending on where the pieces are. But Einstein says it's not quite like that. Space reacts to the existence of mass and what you do with that mass and how the mass is moving. And as a result, that change to space affects how mass moves. Now, one of the big problems is this word here when we talk about mass changes space or curves space or, if you like, warps space, hence the title of this talk. So what do we mean by curved space? How can mass make space change? And in particular, how can it curve? If space is just the gaps between stuff, how can it change? Well, we have to change our thinking, which is the genius of Einstein who came along and said, you can't think of space as simply being nothing in between two masses. You have to think of it more like a jelly. If you think of a jelly, if you put objects in the jelly and move them around, the jelly itself changes. You can distort the jelly, you can set up waves in the jelly, and you have to think of space as if it was something, not as if it was nothing. But how can we talk about something curving? Well, that is indeed a problem. You can always 
think about a two-dimensional object and talk about curving it in the third dimension. You can talk about something which is totally flat, and then we can imagine what would happen if you took that two-dimensional something and curved it into a third dimension. We can imagine that because we live in three dimensions, and so our vision and our brains are capable of understanding what we mean by distorting a two-dimensional object into three dimensions. But how do you take a three-dimensional something and do the same thing? How do you take three dimensions and curve it? Well, you'd need a fourth dimension. And of course, that's rather tricky, because we live in three dimensions of space, as far as we can tell, left, right, forward, backwards, up and down. So we think there are only three dimensions, and we can't imagine what it would look like to take those three dimensions and start wrapping them around a fourth dimension, which we can't imagine. But that's just a limitation of our imagination. As far as the maths is concerned, Einstein said, well, to hell with imagination in that sense. If you do the maths, you can see that the three dimensions of space change according to the existence or motion of mass in the universe. So yes, it's a problem. And I'm not expecting you to be able to visualize what we mean by curved space. We have to simply accept that the mathematics tell us that that's how we can interpret how mass affects space. So we can think of it in terms of, well, OK, if you think again, back to our analogy, if space was only two-dimensional, what would happen if we placed a black hole in a particular position? It would distort space in a similar way to the way we can think of this little picture here of a flat surface being distorted into a sort of well by placing a very heavy object, such as a black hole, at the center of this particular um, region of space. And that's the way that we tend to think of anybody who's trying to give an artistic representation of a black hole. It's essentially impossible to draw it accurately because you can't draw distortions of three-dimensional space. So you tend to end up with pictures of black holes that look a little bit like funnels or water spouts or something like that, where lots of stuff will end up going down this sort of funnel. And that's because we have a limitation on how we can imagine these objects. <coughs> so if this is what Einstein says, why do we believe him? Why do we believe that mass changes space and space can tell mass how to move? Doesn't that seem rather weird? Wouldn't we be better off with just uh, Newton, who says, if you push something, it moves? That's a nice, easy thing to understand. Good old Newton, we understand that. But why do we believe uh, Einstein who says that this weird and wonderful synergy between mass and space exists. Well, there are various observational pieces of evidence that tell us Einstein is right. For instance, the orbit of Mercury doesn't quite run onto itself when you watch Mercury going around the sun, the closest planet to the sun. It doesn't reproduce the same ellipse each time. It slowly swings round. It's called precession. And the amount of precession, how much does the closest point to the sun shift each time Mercury goes around the sun? Newton calculated this, and he got it almost right, but slightly off. And they couldn't quite account for why Newton's calculations were slightly off. Along comes Einstein and says, if you apply the general theory of relativity and take into account the fact that the sun is distorting the space around it, then you get precisely the observed value for the precession of the closest approach of Mercury to the Sun. So Einstein can do better than Newton in terms of doing calculations of things that we can observe. In addition, Einstein says, because the Sun is going to distort the space around it, if we look at the positions of stars during a solar eclipse, when the starlight is just grazing the surface of the Sun, because the sun is distorting the space around it, curving the space around it, if you like, then the light from those distant stars is going to be curved as it passes the surface of the sun. That was predicted by Einstein, and when an eclipse came up in 1919, they looked at the positions of stars, and they were indeed off by the amount that Einstein had predicted, because the starlight did not travel in a straight line from the star to us. It curved slightly as it grazed the surface of the sun. <clears throat>
So we have plenty of evidence that Einstein is right. It's not only a question of distortions of space, we have evidence that time slows down as well. Again, that's a rather odd thing. Newton just says time is time is time. Everybody's clocks agree. Einstein says no. If you're close to a large massive body, time will slow down. Sounds really weird, but it's been experimentally verified. For instance, atomic clocks have been flown on aircraft at various heights, in other words, various distances from the center of the Earth, which means they're in a different value of the gravitational field. And it's been verified that time depends on gravitational pull. Not only that, but we have to take it into account. For instance, if we want to get an accurate fix on where we are in the Earth, on the Earth, we use GPS. We use the global positioning system which relies on atomic clocks in satellites way up in orbit above the Earth. And we work out where we are by looking at the timing of how long it takes a radio signal to go from these satellites to us. And we calculate that for various satellites and hence determine we must be at this location on the Earth in order for the time delay from that satellite and that satellite and that satellite to be what they are observed to be. But if we didn't take into account the fact that atomic clocks in the satellites are actually running at a different speed to atomic clocks on the surface of the Earth, we would get that calculation wrong, and we would not be able to pin down our position on the surface of the Earth to an accuracy of, let's say, less than a meter. So we have to take into account everything that Einstein says, even in daily life when it comes to, for instance, global positioning system. So we have great confidence that what Einstein says is correct. And one of the things that Einstein says is that gravitational objects, such as massive objects like stars, for instance, if they're orbiting around each other, they will produce ripples in space. If we come back to the idea that space is not simply empty, treat it like it's a jelly, then objects such as stars orbiting around each other will produce ripples in the jelly, ripples in space-time. And it's been predicted by general relativity 100 years ago that if you could find a massive enough object moving through space, it could distort space in a manner indicated by this animation, where the amount of distortion is hugely exaggerated. So if you were to take a cylinder, imagine it just being a cylinder cross-section is a circle throughout the cylinder, but if a gravitational wave passes through the cylinder, then it will distort, and the circle will become stretched one way and then stretched the other way. Stretched one way, stretched the other way. Not by 10% or 20% or 30% as indicated by this animation. The amount that we can expect, if, for instance, we have one very massive object orbiting around another, let's say, for instance, one black hole orbiting around another, they would be expected to produce distortions in space-time, not of 10% when measured on Earth, not 5%, not 1%, not one part in a million, but the distortions would be approximately one part in 10 to the power 20. So one part in 100 million, million, million. Tiny, tiny variations. So when Einstein first predicted this, everybody thought, well, OK, but that's going to have no consequences whatsoever. We'll never be able to measure anything to that sort of accuracy. But 100 years later, it was done. And I'll come back to detecting gravitational waves a little later. Firstly, the third piece of the jigsaw, looking at stars and galaxies. We believe that when a star, a massive star, comes to the end of its life, it can go supernova. Stars like our sun simply do not have the mass at the end of their life to compress the material inside the core of the star down to small enough volumes to make a black hole. But if the star was much more massive, let's say about 10 times the mass of our sun, it is thought that when a massive star comes to the end of its life, it is possible that the core of the star collapses under its own weight and forms a black hole. So I'm not going to talk about the details of stellar evolution. That's a different talk, if you're interested. But we think that that is the case. If a star happens to get a little bit too close to a black hole, what can happen 
is that the star can be ripped apart by the tidal forces of the black hole. So we didn't realize at first that there was a black hole lurking in the bottom left of this particular video, and a passing star was ripped apart. It's not the gravitational pull as such. It's the, it's the tides, it's the tidal effects of the gravity on this side of the star being much stronger than the gravity on this side of the star, so the star gets dragged apart. Let's run that video again. So here we have a black hole in the bottom left somewhere, and if a star gets a little bit too close, tidal forces can rip the star apart. Notice that the stuff of the star doesn't all end up going into the black hole. Much like when you empty a bathtub, the water doesn't go instantly down the plug hole. It tends to circulate, waiting its turn before getting its turn to go down the plug hole. And the same is true of matter falling into a black hole. Most of it will end up actually circulating around in a so-called accretion disk. You also perhaps notice that there's some rather odd things going on. Something appears to be coming out of the center. It's not coming from inside the black hole itself, because remember, nothing can come out from inside the black hole. But close to the surface of the black hole, it is possible for some of the energy produced by this infalling matter to end up coming out as jets via a mechanism that we don't really understand how it is that infalling matter can end up being sent out over huge distances, depending on the nature and size of the black hole in question. But what is known is that falling matter, any matter that falls into the black hole, gets heated up because the, all of this matter is jostling for position before it gets sucked into the black hole itself. That produces a very hot disk of gas, this so-called accretion disk. And it is possible to see this accretion disk. We can't see the black hole itself, but it's possible that we can see matter that is falling into a black hole. And we rely on that for getting information about how black holes exist and where they are in the universe. So the idea of ripping things apart because of the huge tidal forces, this is sometimes called spaghettification. Yes, that is a real word. Uh, sometimes called the noodle effect. If, if the gravitational forces of the black hole are very extreme, then no object can fall into a black hole intact, but it will get completely ripped apart. It's actually a very efficient way of converting matter into energy. Dropping objects into a black hole might convert a very large fraction, 20%, 30%, 40%, maybe as much as half of the matter gets converted into energy. That's huge compared to, for instance, our sun, which is sitting there fusing hydrogen into helium, and only a tiny fraction of the matter is actually being converted into energy. In our sun, less than 1% of the matter is converted into energy. If we drop objects into a black hole, substantially more of that fraction of matter could be converted into energy. How do we know what's going on in the center of our galaxy? If we have a look at the stars, and we've been doing this for more than 10 years now, if we watch stars close to the center of our galaxy, we see that they appear to be orbiting around something that we can't see. For instance, here's a star which appears to be orbiting in an ellipse and gets whipped around something. The circle there indicates the center of our galaxy, but there doesn't appear to be an object sitting there. But there must be something, because how can you take a star and whip it around like that over a period of only a few months? There must be huge forces moving these stars around and keeping these stars in orbit. So by looking at how these stars are moving when we stare at the center of the galaxy for many months or preferably many years, we can get an idea. Lots of stars are orbiting something that's relatively small. It can't be big or the stars would be banging into this object. So it must be quite small and yet we can't see anything there. So the orbits of these stars, as indicated by the little animation that I've just showed you, can allow us to calculate the mass of the object that's keeping these stars in orbit. Turns out that the object that we can't see at the center of the galaxy must have a mass of about 4 million solar masses. This symbol at the end here, capital M circle dot, is just a standard abbreviation for the mass of our sun. 
There's no particular special meaning to the mass of our sun. It's just a more convenient unit than using tons or kilograms or anything else. It's just a very large number. And clearly, that means that we have something which is 4 million times the mass of our sun sitting at the center of our galaxy. Just for scale, there's the uh, solar system. There's the solar system, and the inner solar system is simply blown up in this left-hand side there. Let's just think about how big those black holes actually are. From the 4 million solar masses, we can calculate, well, how big must this object be? Remember, we know about escape velocities, and so if we know the mass, we can work out how big must this object be in order to be a black hole. And it turns out that it's bigger than our sun, but much, much, much smaller than the orbit of Mercury. So this object, which is 4 million times bigger than our sun and is holding these various stars in orbit, is tiny compared to the size of our solar system. And remember, this is keeping a lot of stars in orbit. But the supermassive, so-called supermassive black hole, hence SMBH, supermassive simply because it is a million times more massive than our sun, we can look at other galaxies and we find other supermassive black holes that are even more massive than the one in our galaxy. For instance, in the Andromeda galaxy, the supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy is 250 million solar masses rather than simply 4 million solar masses. And on the scale of the solar system, that would be about the size of the orbit of Jupiter. In other words, if it was placed at the center of our solar system, the black hole would extend all the way out to the orbit of Jupiter. That's by no means the largest we know of. There's a galaxy called the Sombrero Galaxy, which appears to have a black hole at the center of one billion times the mass of our sun. And if we were to ask how large is that, we find it would occupy most of the volume up to the orbit of Neptune. That's not quite the uh, record breaker. I haven't checked it in the last few months, but I believe one of the largest black holes known is more than 20 billion solar masses, and it's too big for my diagram. So you get an idea of how large that object would be. It is much, much, much bigger than the solar system that we understand and know and love. Trying to understand how these really big black holes come to be is an ongoing research project. When did they form in the universe? Did they form really early on? Does it take time to grow until they are this big, or do they form really big? That is part of what, for instance, the James Webb Space Telescope is doing, looking at the very early universe, trying to understand how these objects came to be. The Hubble Space Telescope has looked at objects within our solar system, such as star clusters. This is an open cluster, quite a few thousand stars. But even star clusters, nothing to do with the center of our galaxy as such, just a star cluster out in the middle of nowhere. The Hubble Space Telescope has looked at how these stars are moving and found that they move in a similar way to the stars at the center of our galaxy which implies to us that somewhere lurking in the middle of this star cluster, again, is a black hole. We can't see the black hole, but we deduce its existence from the way other stars appear to be orbiting around it. So we look at one cluster, and we deduce there's a black hole at the center. Are all clusters like this? Is this peculiar to this one particular cluster? Or are millions of star clusters out there all hiding a black hole at the center? At the moment, we don't know, which is why more observations are necessary. So we come to the fourth piece of the jigsaw. How do we actually detect the fact that gravitational waves exist? Remember, Einstein said these should exist. He said that back in 1915, more than 100 years ago. So it was decided to build something that could possibly measure these tiny variations in, this, in the size of space, in this ripples in space and time, even though these ripples are absolutely tiny. I still find it incredible that people got the funding to do this, even though it sounds like an absolutely impossible task to see variations as small as one part in 10 to the power 20. This started with a couple of inter interferometers, one in Louisiana, the other in Washington State. 
separated by about 3,000 kilometers or so. Each one is a very large L. And it's an L because a laser starts at the center here and is split into two. One laser beam goes off down one of these arms and hits a mirror and comes back. And the other part of the laser beam goes off along the other arm, hits a mirror, and comes back. And they are at 90 degrees. Remember what we said about what distortions of space would we expect? Well, a circle gets distorted one way, then distorted the other way. Distorted one way, distorted the other way. So if a gravitational wave were to pass through this system, this observatory, it's called the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, just LIGO for short. If a gravitational wave were to pass through, then one arm temporarily would get longer and one would get slightly shorter, and then the other arm would get longer and the first one gets shorter, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. If a gravitational wave passes through, those two arms, which are nominally four kilometers long, they will actually get slightly larger, slightly smaller, slightly larger, slightly smaller. And if you're very, very, very clever, you send a laser from here down each arm, and then you combine the two laser beams when they come back again. They bounce off mirrors. The mirrors are actually quite large, um, sort of a half a meter or so across. These large mirrors are held in suspensions to try and isolate them from the rest of the Earth. You don't want earthquakes making your mirrors move side to side if you're trying to measure tiny variations in length. You bring the lasers back together, and you have an incredibly complex piece of optics which combines these two lasers to see have they arrived back at exactly the same time. If one arm is slightly longer than the other, then the light will come back slightly ahead. And then a fraction of a second later, this one is the longer one, and this one is the shorter one, and there'll be variations in when these two laser beams arrive. And if you build your optical bench um, with enough precision, you hopefully will see an interference between the two waves because one arrives back slightly before the other. But the differences are going to be absolutely, absolutely tiny. But what is really incredible is that in 2016, they announced that they had seen a signal. In other words, they had seen a variation in the lengths of these arms and no one would believe this at all if it wasn't for the fact that the signal in Washington seemed to agree with the signal in Louisiana. If you've got any local interference, like somebody slamming a door or walking past the instrument or a little bit of an earth tremor, then you might get some wiggles indicating, well, these, these mirrors have moved slightly by a tiny amount. But the fact that you get the same pattern in Washington and in Louisiana at essentially the same time tells you that this is not something local. This is not just a lorry traveling down the road in an interstate a few miles away. This is something non-local. And it's by correlating the signal you get from two observatories 3,000 kilometers apart that tells you we've got something real. The scale here tells you how much the length of the arms have changed by. Strain is simply how much is the change compared to the length you're dealing with. So it's a dimensionless quantity. It is how much is the difference, how much is the change compared to the baseline you're dealing with. And the strain was approximately 10 to the minus 21. One part in a thousand million million million. That corresponds over a four kilometer distance to be much less than an atom, much less than the nucleus of an atom, much less than one of the components of the nucleus of an atom. It's something like one thousandth of the diameter of a proton, which is part of a nucleus, which is part of an atom. So being able to calculate with precision these changes is absolutely phenomenal and is an amazing piece of technology. And they deduce that this signal via a mechanism I'm not going to describe, but by it might just look like a wiggle, but this wiggle has a very particular pattern. You might notice that it starts off very small and gets larger and larger and larger and faster and faster and faster. This time scale here is just a fraction of a second. In other words, there's almost nothing to see until the last fraction of a second when this thing seems to get larger in amplitude and faster and faster. 
and they've interpreted that as meaning what you've actually got is two black holes orbiting around each other distorting space, sending out ripples in space. And as these two black holes get closer and closer and closer, they speed up and the distortions of space get larger and larger. So this pattern here, although it looks like just sort of a random uh, five-year-old sketch, it is actually the pattern that you would expect if two black holes orbit each other, get closer and closer and closer together, they speed up, which means the signal gets faster and faster and faster, and grows until the two black holes merge with each other. And then the signal goes away. So this is precisely what you would expect from two black holes combining together. And it's been calculated that what actually happened here was that in a galaxy about a billion light years away, two black holes merged. A black hole of 29 solar masses and a black hole of 36 solar masses merged together to make a black hole of 62 solar masses. They can deduce that from looking at the pattern of this wiggle. 29 plus 36 doesn't equal 62. We've lost three solar masses by taking this much stuff and this much stuff, smudging it together, we've lost three solar masses. Three masses, three times the mass of our sun, have been converted in its entirety from mass into energy. And that energy was dissipated in the form of gravitational waves. And even though this took place a billion light years away, it was still detectable on Earth. And the technology required to do that is absolutely phenomenal. The energy required was huge. The energy required to give us a detectable signal a billion light years away, it's been calculated that the energy of the merger of these two objects, if you remember the time scale, it only took place in a fraction of a second. During the merger of those two black holes, for about a tenth of a second, the total energy of that event was probably larger than the total energy coming from all of the stars in all of the galaxies in the known universe. For that fraction of a second, that one event produced more energy than the rest of the universe put together. That's a rather incredible merger of two black holes. That proved that it is possible to measure gravitational waves 100 years after Einstein said they should exist. It is now planned to put these interferometers in space. Rather than limit yourself to a four kilometer arm, why not put satellites up into space and send lasers between different satellites? You can move these satellites so that they are a million kilometers apart if you wanted to, and then send lasers back and forth and back and forth. And there are plans to do that. The technology is being developed, and it might be that by next decade, we have a space-based interferometer. It's called LISA, or ELISA is the current plan. Now, LIGO is sensitive to, for instance, black holes merging together or neutron stars merging together because these tend to happen on very short timescales of a fraction of a second or something when they actually merge together. And the four kilometer arms of LIGO are suitable for picking up black hole mergers or neutron star mergers. It is hoped that ELISA, with a much longer arm of millions of kilometers, will be sensitive to much larger black holes, such as the supermassive black holes that are lurking at the center of our galaxy and the center of the Andromeda galaxy and the center of, as far as we can tell, every galaxy in the universe. Who knows, it might be also that the space-based interferometer might be able to detect the gravitational waves that came from the biggest gravitational anomaly that we know of, the Big Bang. The creation of the universe presumably would have produced ripples in space-time. Maybe a space-based interferometer can help us see those. So the Event Horizon Telescope, which is simply taking a lot of radio telescopes and linking them together over the size of the Earth, has been able to image what's going on around the supermassive black hole of another galaxy. The galaxy is called M87, 
an M87 star simply refers to the black hole at the centre of that galaxy. And the fact that we see just an orange smudge, the smudge means it's a long way away, so we can't expect to get much more detail. But the fact that we see a donut tells us that it looks like we've got an accretion disk. It looks like stuff is falling into this black hole. We can't see the black hole itself. There's a shadow in the middle of this object. But we do seem to be getting radio emission from the ring of matter this warm or hot ring of matter that's waiting its turn to get sucked into the black hole. This accretion disk is radiating light at lots of different wavelengths and is picked up by this radio, uh, this set of radio telescopes around the world. As well as looking at other galaxies, the, uh, the same set of radio telescopes were looking to see what's going on within our galaxy and what they produced looks superficially very similar. In other words, there seems to be a sort of donut-shaped accretion disk of matter swirling around our black hole. It looks a little different, and they're trying to understand why that is. But one thing to bear in mind is that our black hole, the black hole at the centre of our galaxy, is not particularly large compared to the black hole at the centre of M87. But M87 is a lot further away. So we've got a small object fairly close and a large object a long way away. So in terms of how large they appear on the sky, they're very similar. But in terms of their absolute size, we have to remind ourselves that the accretion disk around the monster in the middle of M87 galaxy is huge, and at the same scale, the accretion disk around our sun would barely be visible as one pixel if we were to take it at the same size, rather than just how large it appears simply because the centre of our galaxy is a lot closer to us than the centre of the galaxy M87. But it is possible to use radio telescopes to see, not the black holes themselves, but to see the accretion disks that are forming around these black holes. So we have lots of experimental evidence that these things exist, both on the small scale and on this monster scale of millions, if not billions, of solar masses. So let me finish just by saying a few things about science fiction. Does Hollywood ever get it right when it's talking about black holes? Here's three movies that you may or may not have seen. One goes back quite a long way, Disney's The Black Hole. I'm not sure if you remember that, er Ernest Borgnine and others there, Maximilian Schell, etc. The middle one is a, a more recent one, Lost in Space. And on the right-hand side, we have either a sci-fi or a horror, depending on how you think of it, Event Horizon. In these three films, in the first one, they said, we want to study a black hole, and we know that time stands still at the event horizon of a black hole. So what we're going to do is to take a ship to the event horizon, put on the handbrake, and sit there for a while and watch what happens. OK, scenario one. In Lost in Space, they are trying to get away from a planet, and the planet, for whatever reason, suddenly decides it wants to collapse into a black hole. And as they are trying to pull away from the black hole, uh, the planet, everything appears to be okay, but when the mass compresses into a black hole, the ship suddenly gets pulled backwards. And in Event Horizon, there is a ship that is powered by an onboard black hole. So, three scenarios. Two of those things are absolute rubbish, and one of them is plausible. Okay? Show of hands. <laughs> Who thinks the plausible one is the one on the left? You go to Event Horizon, put on the handbrake, and, and basically observe the black hole. Anybody happy with that? What about the middle one? Is it feasible that if you're trying to pull away from a planet and the planet suddenly uh, collapses into a black hole, you'll end up getting pulled backwards because of the black hole? Is that a reasonable scenario? OK. We have a couple there. Two, three. And um, what about the idea that, well, if you wanted to, you could use a black hole as a power source, and you could, um, you could basically make a starship by using a black hole as the power source. Plausible? Reasonable? Ridiculous? Nobody wants to commit themselves. <laughs> black hole parking at the event horizon. The idea that time slows down, Einstein told us that time is relative. It depends on who is measuring or watching the clock. <laughs> 
if a ship goes to the event horizon, as far as an observer well away from the black hole is concerned, time appears to slow down in that the ship will go slower and slower and slower and slower as it approaches the event horizon. But if you were on board the ship, you would just go straight in and not realize that time was slowing down because you don't have anything else to judge it by. You would simply go straight into the black hole. It's only when seen relative to somebody else that time appears to slow down. So you can't go to the event horizon, park there, and say, it's OK, time has stopped, so I can just sit here and watch the black hole. That doesn't work. The, the middle one, lost in space, if you have a certain mass like a planet pulling on a spaceship, then there's a certain force on that spaceship. Or in Einstein's way of thinking of it, it distorts space in such a way that it tends to want to pull that object back. But if you take that planet and collapse everything to a black hole, you've still got the same mass. Yes, it's a lot more concentrated. It's in one place rather than distributed. But it's still the same mass. It's like saying, what if I were to stand here and all the mass of the Earth were to be compressed into a marble? Well, as long as it's still 6,000 kilometers away, which is how far I am at the moment from the center of the Earth, take the same mass and keep it at the same distance, you wouldn't know the difference. The Earth goes round the Sun. If you were to take the Sun and compress it all until it was a black hole, the Earth would still go round the Sun. It would still feel the same gravitational force because it's the same mass at the same distance. The fact that it's all concentrated into a black hole, that means we don't get any light from the sun, but the Earth would still orbit just the same. So a ship would not magically be pulled backwards just because the planet decided to make itself a black hole. The same mass would be there, and therefore the ship would still need to put the same power into the same engines in order to escape. It wouldn't simply go up by a factor of 10 or 100 just because it made a black hole. This one is plausible. You can, in principle, think about making a black hole-powered star drive. We don't know how, but it doesn't break any laws of physics to say you could do it. If the black hole is quite small, let's say less than a kilogram, you're not going to get much energy out of that. Einstein says the most energy you can ever hope to get out of a mass is E equals mc squared. If you've only got a kilogram to play with, you're not going to get much energy out of it. If the black hole is really large, let's say more than the size of Mount Everest, then the amount of radiation coming from the black hole is very weak. Hawking said that all black holes will radiate from just outside the event horizon. It's not coming from inside, it's radiating from just outside the event horizon. And Hawking said that large black holes radiate a little bit, small black holes radiate a lot. So you don't want the black hole to be too large, otherwise you don't get much radiation from it. But if you choose something in the sweet spot, let's say a black hole with a mass of a million tons, then the radiation from it would be equivalent to the output of 100 million nuclear power stations. And the black hole wouldn't last forever, but it would last for about a century or so. So it gives you all the energy, well, pretty much all the energy you need. If you've got 100 million nuclear power stations, 100 million gigawatts at your disposal, you can accelerate objects quite happily. And you would only need to refresh the black hole once every 100 years or so by pulling into a station, swapping out your little black hole for a new black hole. So there's no laws of physics that are broken by doing that. So the black hole, how big would the black hole be? Well, if you took a million tons and compressed it to a black hole, it would be about the size of an atom. So it, your engine room would probably be tiny, but you would have enough energy at your disposal to accelerate objects almost as fast as you like. Let me finish with a few comments. If black holes distort space, is it possible to distort space in such a way that you end up with a shortcut? Could you end up with a wormhole taking you from one part of space to another part of space? Well, in principle, yes, we know it's possible because we've seen it on TV in Stargate and Contact and Star Wars and Star Trek. We know it must be possible, otherwise where would these science fiction writers get their ideas from? So. We don't know how to do that. 
It doesn't break any laws of physics, but we don't know how to do it. How would we get enough matter in the right place at the right time to distort space in a way that gives us a wormhole? doesn't break any laws of physics, but we simply do not know how to do it. The other problem is, well, not only would you distort space, you would distort time as well. So wouldn't you end up with a time machine if you distorted space that allows you to s sort of short circuit from one part of space-time to another part of space-time? Depending on your age, you might think of time travel in terms of the uh, early version of the time machine from H.G. Wells, or depending on your age, you might think of more contemporary versions. But of course, if you have time travel, you have a problem. What if you go back in time and kill your grandfather? You end up with a paradox of, well, that can't happen, but how does that get stopped from being happen? It's a problem. And we don't know how to get around this problem of time travel producing a paradox of, well, if you go back in time, you can change history. But is history immutable, or is it possible to go back in time and change history? Hawking had an idea, the chronology protection conjecture. And as you can see from the third word, it is a conjecture. There's no proof of this. But he said, maybe it's possible to make a wormhole. And in principle, you could go through the wormhole to go back in time. But a wormhole that would allow time travel, it would collapse before anything has time to actually go back in time. In other words, nature protects itself. There's no reason to think that that's the case, but it gets around the paradox of what if you went back in time and killed your grandfather. So maybe all wormholes protect time by making sure they collapse before anything can happen. Basically, making the universe safe for historians. In other words, you can't change history. But there is a problem. We know that general relativity works really well for massive objects like stars. And there's a theory that deals with objects that are very small called quantum mechanics. And that works really well for things like atoms, for instance. But what if the object is really massive and really tiny, like a black hole? Well, then we need to put those two things together, general relativity and quantum mechanics, into quantum gravity. The problem is no one has succeeded in putting these two fundamental theories together. The theory of space and time from Einstein and the theory of quantum mechanics, both of which have been proven time and time again over the past 100 years, nobody has found a way of getting these two theories to gel together. They do not appear to be good bedfellows. A so-called theory of everything has proven to be very Elusive. Einstein. Einstein. Yep. Einstein never really believed in quantum mechanics being the right description of the microscopic world. He spent a lot of his later years, after developing special the theory of relativity and general theory of relativity, he spent most of his latter years trying to get a theory of everything to work. And what happened is it turned that young gentleman into the Einstein that we know and love. And basically, he never succeeded in producing a theory of everything. So if a genius like Einstein could not get his head around the problem, what will it take before we really understand objects that are very massive and very small? Well, it probably will take some unexpected discoveries which are maybe around the corner. They might be discoveries from LIGO. They might be discoveries from the space-based version of the interferometer, LISA or ELISA. And maybe that will help point the way to a better understanding of black holes. Thank you very much for listening.